Hi, everybody. My name is Eike van Vught, co-founder and CEO of VS Particle. Today, we talk about simplified, scalable, and clean production of catalyst coated membranes. The agenda of today will be the following. First, I will give a company introduction on VS Particle. Then I will explain the customer needs in the market of catalyst coated membranes. I will briefly introduce VS Particle technology explain something about process control and scalability. And then I will hand over the mic to Erdem, who will show the printer in the lab um, so that you can see the product in action. At the end, we will give a live Q&A to answer all your questions. VS Particle is a company co-founded from the University of TU Delft um, back in 2014. And we have a clear vision. It said solutions for big issues are urgently needed. Big issues like climate change, the topic we will discuss today, need to be solved urgently in order to maintain human life on Earth and for the centuries to come. We believe that new materials will enable impactful solutions. Technology and material innovation play a pivotal role in solving these issues. The only problem is that these materials are sometimes not there yet. So we need those material innovations in the market fast. So together with a team of brilliant people, we do everything we can to get this material in time to the market. So today it still takes 15 years on average to get a new material into the market. And everything we do at Visa Particle is to contribute to our promise. Our aim is to unlock a century of material innovation in the next decade. Do what normally would take hundreds of years in next 10 years. So let me go into the customer needs, those needs that we see on a daily basis. To meet the extraordinary demand for green hydrogen, a huge amount of innovation is needed in the next years. The market of electrolyzers needs to scale 200 volts, reducing the costs by 80%, but also increasing the efficiency. And on top, the usage of iridium needs to be reduced or optimized by 20 to 40 times to really enable this market to scale to the hundreds of gigawatts that is needed. So to stay relevant in the market of PEM water electrolysis, our customers need to improve on three things. And all of them are related to the catalyst coated membranes. Higher efficiency and stability, you reduce material and production cost and increase membrane size. And I will briefly explain what this means. If you want to increase the efficiency and stability, you need to optimize the configuration of the gas diffusion layer or porous transport layer, the catalyst and the polymeric membrane. And to do that effectively, you need to have control over all these different um, parameters mentioned on the left. Elemental composition, oxidation state, particle size, surface contamination, porosity, layer uniformity, printing accuracy. All these parameters need to be changed and optimized to find the most best performing catalyst coated membrane. The second thing that our customers are worrying about is that to reduce material and production cost, all the different components from the MEIA need to be reduced. Thinner bipolar plates, thinner gas diffusion layers, thinner catalyst layers, thinner membranes. And this all is needed um, to both reduce the use of materials, improve the use of iridium, but also on top of that, you need to reduce the number of production steps. The quicker and cheaper production is, the cheaper the end product will become and the less risk of, let's say, impurities or variations you have in the process. The second one is if you want to go to very big membranes to really scale towards gigawatt um, electrolyzers, you need to have a process that can apply the catalyst layer in a very sensitive way onto this very stretched thin membrane. Otherwise, if, it's, if there's too much energy or pressure needed to do this, you will puncture the membrane with devastating results on the performance. So I hope this gives you an idea of what the market is currently looking for and the challenges that our customers are facing. So let's talk about VS Particle. We introduce a brand new method to make and manufacture catalyst coated membranes. In this way, we think we can redefine CCM production. 
We do this by both introducing next generation material synthesis, but also introducing a new dry coating technology. And both of these steps we incorporate into a single fully automated tool that you can use at the push of a button. And by doing this, we both eliminate all chemistry out of the production process, but most importantly, we eliminate six of the seven production steps, drastically simplifying manufacturing, making it easier to scale um, and, and improving the quality control in the whole process. So all in all, by doing this, we drastically accelerate the development cycles. That means that you can iterate prototype much faster with our process than with the state-of-the-art process. And on the other side, we simplify and skill production. You don't need to become a wet chemical expert to make this um, process happen. On top, with our unique nano aerosol process technology, we already are introducing the highest level of quality control. In our case, we can measure the particle size distribution just before we are directly printing it onto the membrane. And this is something you cannot see with any of the other technologies. So most importantly, looking at the customer needs on the left, process control, rapid prototyping, low iridium loadings, um, less production steps, and another uh, a low process intensity, you can see that the state-of-the-art process um, is scoring much lower than our process on all these different aspects. So as I showed you, we have very high inline quality control. Uh, we can change process parameters on the fly. We can change particle size. We can change elemental composition uh, with a simple push of a button. We, by doing a dry deposition, can do a very low iridium loading. It's just a single step, uh, no chemicals involved, no drying step afterwards. So we really think that our technology will, will function as a very solid base for the coming generations of catalyst coated membranes. To give you a bit of feeling on how this looks like, here you see some initial results we have obtained together with DIFFER and have been published. And you can find the results also on our website. On the left, you can see that the nanoparticles printed by our technology are very small in the order of two nanometer on average. And you see that they form a very unique nanoporous open structure. Compared to the commercial membranes, to the commercial catalyst, they are much, much smaller uh, and packed closely on top of each other. This is also the case if you compare our uh, coatings compared to the state of the art uh, catalyst or red chemical coatings, is that we have a much thinner, much more homogeneous, much more uh, smooth surface um, that has uh, beneficial um, effects onto the performance of the CCM. So the best performing CCM at the moment is this light blue line. Uh, so the dark blue line is the state of the art performance. Uh, it's not our membrane. The light blue one is our best performing CCM with 0 0.4 milligram per square centimeter of iridium, um, which is much, much lower than the dark blue one. If you want to know more information about performance in these things, feel free to always contact us. So to give you some some input again on the tool that we are supplying. So we sell our technology in the form of these tools. And the scope of the tool is just to take the bulk iridium as an input, to take the clean membrane as an input. And our system breaks the iridium up um, into the, the right nanoparticles and directly print them um, in, the, in a well-mannered, very nanoporous structure uh, on top of the membrane. And then what comes out of the system is this catalyst-coated membrane um, um, that you are looking for. And in our, in the way our tool is operating, you are able to control all those different process parameters that I already explained um, in previous uh, slides where I talked about improving the efficiency. On the other side, we don't supply only research tools. Uh, we think to really make impact and get material innovation quicker to the market, we need to supply the whole value chain. So from research tools, process development tools, optimizing your production process, all the way to high volume production tools. Um, and in this slide, you can see our timeline and, and roadmap to get the other products into the market. So 
I hope I could give you a little bit of context on why catalyst coated membranes are so important and why they are the essential ingredient yes. to enable a massive new industry of green hydrogen. I also showed you the fundamental needs of our customers, so on which aspects they need to improve um, and come up and design better catalyst coated membranes. I showed you the benefits of our technology compared to the state of the art wet chemical synthesis and coating process. I showed you the process parameters that we can variate in our printing process. So I think now it's time to hand over the mic to Erdem, who will give you a real look into the product and that you can see how the system is operated. And in the end, uh, you can always contact us in the Q&A or afterwards send out an email for a follow-up discussion. So I would like to thank you for your time and I wish you all the best in the demo from Erdem. Now I will walk you through the system states and how to use the P1 to generate catalyst coated layers on, it, on any given substrate. Right now, here I have a titanium PTL porous transfer layer and the stage, flat stage that we will use for today's demonstration. After assembling and installing, the titanium PTL onto our stage. Then we will load the stage into the holder inside the chamber. In order to do that, first, I have to open the three locks, which are first lift up the three handles one by one, and then turn them in the clockwise direction so that they will spring back. <clears throat> the door will automatically open up, it will let loose, and now the system is ready to insert your stage. The stage could be glide directly in with, through two slits. And when you push it, you will feel that it uh, touches to the end of the stage, that you cannot push it anymore. And that's why you know that it is properly installed. Later on, you will support from the back, close the door, push the springs in and turn them in the counter clock direction, one by one. And then finally, closing the black handles so that the system will be sealed for the initial pump down procedure. Now, I will show you how to use the user interface. For the sake of this webinar, at, at the moment we are going to be using the monitor, but also the users can employ and use all the functionalities of the printer by using the, the tablet monitor on the printer. But for this webinar, for you to follow my steps more clearly and take it take the, my indications more clearly, we will be performing the actions in the monitor. But in the meantime, there will be some steps that we can also show them on the uh, tablet that the screen is identical. But for the sake of this webinar, first, we will uh, use mainly the monitor. Now I will show you how to use the system states in the user interface. The first step of the system states is the standby. In the standby, you see that the system is in atmospheric condition. One after installing the stage, the first thing is to do to bring the system in the system assembly mode. In this mode, you will see camera functions, the lightning, fu lightning functions where you can change the chamber light. <clears throat> and there are two different cameras that you can see, which is the overview camera and the zoom camera, which gives you much higher resolution. On the middle side of the panel, you see the X, Y, and Z motors, which you can control the gantry stage. The position of the sample in the X and Y axis, and then the, by the Z motor, you can control the substrate to nozzle height distance. Just under that, you see the numeric controls where you can put speed and the position that you would like to move. By clicking on and off, you can activate or deactivate 
any motor. You just have to click on go so that the motors will be offline right now. So what we would like to do is to turn on the motors because we would like to position the stage where the nozzle is so that we can perform a leak tight test. <clears throat> the last part is on the right side of this step is the nozzle type. Here we are using nozzle type one to five and then click go. Once you go in this three sub steps, then the system assembly step is completed and you can start performing a leak test. In order to perform the leak test, first we will position the nozzle onto the leak pad of the stage. To do that, in the system assembly stage, I will use the jogging option to move the stage. So I'm using the joystick and I'm moving it up. on the Y direction. So now it is positioned right under the nozzle and I'm going to move the Z motor to push the stage up and clock block the nozzle. So now I am pressing the X motor in units of 1000 micron steps. After careful positioning, the nozzle now I'm sure that I blocked the nozzle onto the pad. Now it is possible to perform the leak test. Once the stage is proper, then the nozzle is sealed onto the pad. Next we will Return back to the user interface and click on the icon that says Perform Leak Test. So now I'm clicking Perform Leak Test and the system, system is running through several stages, which is all the required devices are connected and initialized. Then it closes the valve, but open the gas inlet and sets the mass flow controller pressures. During this time, there is a flow onto the pad and then when the pressure is reached to the upper limit, the gas flow is stopped and then the uh, stability of this pressure is monitored. So right now, the pressure drop is monitored. Then if there is a particular drop beyond the lower limit, then the leak test will be failed. Though in this case, we know that the system is leak tight, but still it's a safety procedure to perform this leak test every time. This step usually takes around four minutes. And here we can follow up in the red dotted line how much the pressure change over the four minute time. So as you see, after the stopping of the flow, the pressure stabilized at 100, around 198 millibar versus atmosphere. So now the system is checking whether during this four minute period, the drop will be beyond the threshold. In case that the Safe, uh, the safety limit is passed and the system fails the leak tight stage. There are steps that you can follow in the user manual. So you can always look for the troubleshooting for such uh, errors. But in this case, it looks like uh, the system will pass. So it's in the last uh, minute for uh, the validation. We 
which is around one more minute to go. So from the starting point, 198, we are at uh, around 197.5, so it is only a drop of 0 0.5 millibar. <clears throat> Now the system has passed the leak test and now we can say that the system is leak tight. The system is ready to go to the next, sta next stage, which is the vacuum stage. So now we will click on go to the vacuum and the system is now performing the pump down procedure, which opens the gas net valve and opens the end filter valve starting the flow of mass flow controllers and then setting the valve and starting the vacuum pump. You can hear the pump running right now, which is also an indication that the system is completely uh, okay and functional. So after reaching a certain uh, pressure in the pump down procedure, the system automatically jumps into the printing step, which is the last step which you can set up your uh, controls such as what is the script that you would like to upload, what is the uh, flow rate conditions that you would like to apply. So let's walk you through those. On the left side, you will have the main uh, gas flow that feeds the nanoparticles as a stream of aerosol. So you can put here a flow rate of one, two, three, four uh, liters per minute. So right now we are going to put two liters per minute. And then also you have, which is in the same um, unit, that the uh, voltage and current applied to generate the spark in this uh, uh, parameter that we are going to update Iridium. And we are going to apply 1.3 kilovolts and 10 milliamps. So we can uh, start the spark state on and click go. On the middle part, you will see the bypass gas automatically set to 1.4 liter per minute. So this is the gas that uh, you can use to shield the uh, nanoparticles at the nozzle so that uh, during the opening and closing of this print valve, you can uh, block or unblock the stream of these nanoparticles. So when you are moving on the stage, there won't be any particles leaching from the nozzle. Again, you have the controls underneath where you can use the camera functions to see your sample from the top and also the chamber light if you would like to keep it on or off. On the right part, you always have the X, Y, Z stage positions, which you can control different positions. You can use the jogging again and a part that you can upload the script to develop any pattern that you want. For instance, let's look at what kind of patterns that we can develop. When I click on the CML patterning, I am jumping to the next segment where I can generate, for instance, a circle. When I click on the run, I see a pattern that I'm forming a circle. When I click on the snake, when I run, I can perform a rectangle by playing with uh, different parameters such as the total length, total width, and the number of steps that you would like to apply. You can perform different uh, shapes. For instance, here, let's say 10,000, uh, which is uh, one centimeter on all directions. And here you can perform a square. So once you obtain the code that you would like to have to control the gantry stage, you will copy this uh, 
uh, code, sorry. And then you will paste this code into the script menu. Once your starting position is set, you will click on the go button to start the printing procedure. Here you also have options that uh, give a callback function about uh, telling the machine what to do at the end of the printing. You can tell uh, to do nothing at the end of the print so it will continue to spark. Or you can tell to go to atmospheric which will stop the sparking and then go to then the chamber will evacuate, flush and apply a cycle to rinse the chamber so that you can open the chamber safely. Or you can go to the vacuum pause which will stop the G1 but the system will remain in the vacuum mode so you can continue with another operation the next day or in the next sample. So now I will uh, show you at the end of the print what, what the sample looks like. Once our print has finished, now we will collect the sample from the chamber. <clears throat> in order to do that, I will use the jog function to bring the stage closer to the door. So I will jog closer to the door by moving the jog on the lower direction, on the y-axis, which I can also perform the same from the tablet. And then check if the use in the user interface, the system is in the standby state. So we will. Uh, we noticed that the system is in the standby state, and now we can open and collect the sample. Now the print is finished. The system returned back to the atmospheric conditions, followed by a flash cycle. We can now open the door. In order to do that, we just unblocked the handles, turn them in clockwise direction. They spring back, and then just push the door. Now we can access the stage and we just slide it out and reach the sample. So here, our sample is coated with our uh, iridium layer on this example, on the titanium porous transfer layer. Now the printing is completed. We close back the chamber door to avoid any contamination in our chamber. And the system is in the standby mode. Now we will continue where we left off in the webinar. Okay. Um, now we will. Uh, now we are back with the um, webinar um, with the presentation. Let me arrange something very fast. All right. Let's make it like a reporter view so it will be more interactive. And then the slides. OK. All right, so let's see how it looks. Mm. One second. It is um, this option. Windows and webinar slides. All right. Yes, I think this is more convenient. OK, um, now I will um, enlarge the screen and let me know. I hope you can. Um, I hope you can see the screen uh, clearly. If not, uh, please let me know. And uh, welcome everyone. So I assume there are no objections. So I assume uh, you are seeing the um, slide, the initial uh, slide correctly, and you can hear me well. Um, all right, so I would like to say welcome to everybody. Um, thanks for uh, listening this so far. Um, today I will give you, demonstrate you some uh, application points and some um, protocols that you can apply, some materials that you can generate using uh, G1P1 combination. My name is Ardemir Tam. I'm an application specialist in VS Particle. 
And today's talk topic is simplified, scalable and clean production of catalyst coated membranes for green hydrogen. So what you will see uh, in, in this around 10, 15 minutes talk, um, two main things. Uh, the first one is how does G1, P1 combination work? I will just show you a flow diagram, the features of printer, just one slide animation type of uh, scheme uh, of the system. And then we will jump right into, um, let's see if I can use the pointer. Yeah, then we can uh, jump right into the uh, uh, the versatility of the printer. What what are the options that you can do? For example, I will present you ten example cases. Almost half of them are the applications that has been already done, or has been um, that we have been doing right now, or like some of them that we would like to do in the near future, or our um, but which could be applied by you by anyone else. So let's see how does the G one P one combination work. As you have seen in the video as well, um, in the video we have one G1 at the top, um, but here, I, for example, um, for like imagination, I put two G1s, two generators on top of the printer, which is possible. And uh, at the bottom part, you have the printer assembly. So there is a supply of the gas and there is a mass flow control system um, which feeds the gas to G1 and then generation of particles. Inside you have two different cameras and nozzle. Uh, there is an inlet port for flushing the system with air, outlet port, and the pump and the stage. So let's go through how does it how does it go. So at first, the system is air, right? Because we open and close the door. First, we start by pumping out uh, the air, uh, so it's under the vacuum and supplying the uh, argon gas to the um, to the generators. Uh, when we uh, start on uh, st uh, the generators, they will start to spark. And you see, um, for, if you have a viewport, you can see when the sparking uh, with your eyes uh, with a from a protective window. Um, then you have the stream of aerosol, so argon gas with the nanoparticles generated, let's say iridium and nickel in this case, that is flowing to the nozzle. So this is the part that uh, under the vacuum right now, and from the nozzle, the nanoparticles are um, um, going downwards. And when you're moving the stage, you are building up a film and constantly the vacuum is also pumping the particles out or in any, anything out, keeping the system at a certain, um, uh, uh, certain pressure, certain vacuum, let's say. Uh, like I explained, you also have what we call bypass flow. So this is another flow channel, which is going, let's say, vertical to the uh, horizontal to the uh, nozzle or to the main gas flow. So this is when you would like to like turn on, turn off, let's say, to the to the flow, uh, to the, uh, the flow of the iris also the substrate. So this is a very advanced feature that you can like in a matter of milliseconds stop and start the flow, but you don't have to start or stop the uh, sparking. So you will continue to have a staple spark, but you will just rinse or uh, flush the material to a filter. So for instantaneous actions, this is quite uh, uh, useful. When you are uh, done with the printing, you yeah, supply the air in, then flush the air out. So this is um, a flush system, flush cycle that you can do as much as you want, just to clean whatever particles suspended in the air, and then it is safe to open the, the chamber and you can pick up your sample. Uh, if you would have a tray automized to this uh, hood as well, so this, this could be also integrated in a let's say, a more um, automated system as well. So let's see some of the examples. Uh, what can the combination do? Starting with the first and the most obvious one is you can synthesize nanoparticles, yeah? So this synthesis of nanoparticles could be almost any substrate. It could be uh, on like small, in this case, for example, you see small titanium disks or glassy carbon um, rods or uh, silicon chips that um, are a few millimeters in size. So if, when when we show you those like a microscope and SCMTM images, you see really the scale of the surface area that you might have by using nanoparticles. So in this case, um, there's a half, almost half a million of magnification. You can see nanoparticles in the range of around like uh, four nanometers, four to five nanometers. 
the same nanometers, uh, nanometer particles, same nanoparticles could be also um, immobilized on a membrane. Um, so this, in this case, this membrane is uh, 50 millimeters, so 10 times uh, bigger in uh, one direction. So its surface area is much, much higher, let's say geometric surface area. And when we scrape a sample and look at the TM, we see the same nanoparticles, which shows the versatility of this of this technique. So you can employ immobilize uh, the same catalyst on any surface, and you can try many different uh, attri um, try many, many different applications. I think this is quite useful. When we look at a benchmark CCM, um, and when we scrape samples from that and look in the ACM uh, TM, we also see uh, much much larger uh, particles um, which also shows the unique feature of this of this system so if you would like to know more about this you can always go to the reference article that we have published recently so let's move on what kind of uh, for example substrates and what is the advantage here um, like i said you can em employ it on very tiny uh, surfaces or very large um, membranes for example in this case this membrane is almost uh, i think seven centimeters or uh, let's see one two three four five six oh, sorry six centimeters six by six i guess um, but in the past we, we also have uh, uh, produced the membranes slightly larger than that like seven by seven centimeters so when we when we look at the, um, uh, by the way, I forgot to say, I will collect all your uh, questions in the end. We will have a Q&A session, so I can always go back to those slides and pick up your particular questions regarding the slide. So please look at the slide number. Um, so when we scrape and look at um, uh, the cross sections sorry, of those um, nafine iridium, for example, combination, we, we see a really good adhesion of the iridium nanoparticles onto the nafine. So this is also very uh, important for a high performing, high performing and stable CCM. Um, but on top of that, we, the, this versatility of applying um, catalysts and particles on any substrate has, in my opinion, a huge advantage because we would like to conduct the same analysis on the same, uh, same different analysis on the same catalyst, either a very fundamental research or, or applied research on a very small batch system or in a synchrotron device that you would like to implement uh, in an um, um, in-situ operation, but also you would like to get the same catalyst on a industrial uh, setup system, right, in a, like a electrolyzer setup. So in that case, it's quite important that you are working with the same catalyst material. So what else? Um, with, uh, with the printer, uh, we also have our own um, software. So in this software, you can also create um, any pattern that you would like to have, and you can also visualize it before you create this pattern. What I mean here is, for example, like you have seen very briefly in the video, you can form a circular pattern to create a um, like a square a circle uh, uh, layer. You can change the step size of the circle. Uh, you can create a small large squares or you can deposit or immobilize nanoparticles at the uh, at one go on, for example, in this case, I think five by five or one by one on different spots. So you can just uh, create those uh, uh, patterns uh, and then press the button and then uh, exit the lab or go home and the machine will do everything itself and in the morning everything will be ready, everything will be done. Um, what about the loading and the porosity? These are the questions that we also often often face. Um, so you can control the loading in this case, for example, from a similar article, from the same article, you can see that uh, the iridium content was um, controlled by changing the deposition time. So instead of yeah, creating a deposit in an hour, you create it in two hours or three hours or four hours or 10 minutes. So then you are changing basically how much milligram you have on the sample per hour. Then uh, when we check this sample on the Rutherford um, backscattering spectrometry, we find out that um, it's quite uniform, this um, loading um, profile in different um, different settings. So this is also can be found in the same article with further more information. Um, so let's check the porosity very, very quickly. You can form um, different porosity with the printer as well. So um, this is right now we can, of course, change many parameters, but we can do this right now by, by changing the nozzle 
to a substrate distance. So uh, it's, a, it's a certain limit. Uh, we have a smooth film, let's say. Uh, of course, the smooth and roughness is under debate, right? So it, what is smooth for you could be rough for someone else. Um, but when when we play with this um, distance from substrate and also we can at the same magnification here, you see the same substrate, the same catalyst. We can form more porous, um, more rough um, surface, which is quite interesting for electrocatalysis applications or any catalysis applications, to be honest, even for adsorption studies. Um, again, the advantage is to keep this uh, particle integrity, like uh, you still had the same nanoparticle particle of the same size uh, on this. I think somebody's mic is open, but uh, I, OK, I think you can hear me well. Um, so you, you, you still have the same nanoparticle, particle, but just you can play with the smooth or rough surface. Um, so this is a great advantage of the printer. Um, so what about the B metallic uh, catalyst layers? How do you control the stoichiometry? So this is also a question that's quite asked. Um, this is quite significant in, I will give you three examples. One of the, the first one is pan water electrolysis. Um, we know that there are different elements which are more active uh, with a uh, trade-off of stability, but this is an ongoing investigation to find that sweet spot. So this could be um, conducted by either mixing um, two different electrodes uh, in one stream or uh, having a pre-alloyed electrodes and mixing them in one stream or using two different uh, G1s. For the alkaline exchange membrane water electrolysis, we already have a paper um, which was published around two, three years ago uh, in collaboration with Avancium and uh, several, several academic partners that we have investigated nickel-iron um, um, combination and uh, check their uh, onset voltage. Uh, for uh, water electrolysis al alkaline media. And this was conducted on 64 different samples in by analyzing their uh, in a high throughput kind of system electrolyzer that Avancium has. So VSP's contribution in that is to realize those catalyst particles on those 64 spots, like uh, in this patterning um, uh, capabilities that I explained in the earlier slide. Um, the third example in this fifth category stoichiometry is for CO2 electrolysis. Lately, um, that's my main, one of my main expertise um, in CO2 electrolysis. Lately, copper silver has received quite a lot of attention, attraction for its ability to generate more CO and increase more CO, CO coupling for, for C2 kind of products. Um, so it is believed that uh, silver is providing more carbon monoxide. And there, there is, in fact, uh, silver copper publication which has been conducted with ablation uh, technology um, with the same um, with the same similar um, uh, machines that we have in the lab and uh, they were able to show that silver copper could be uh, mixed at a higher ratio than the conventional method and um, they just uh, have a pre-alloyed uh, copper silver but after the ablation the, the ratio was uh, the mix mixing was much uh, much uniform so they checked the xrd and they this in fact talk about something quite interesting which also i made the link with co2 electrolysis because they mentioned that with silver having 144 picometer of a diameter and the copper has 127 when they look at the peaks of the silver there was a lattice contraction according to the peak shift and appearance of the new peaks and then there is lattice expansion for the copper appearance of the new peaks and the uh, peak shift, uh, the Bragg peak shifting. So that brings the interesting question to my head, like, OK, that sounds like a sweet spot for ethylene um, because most of those papers, they report higher ethylene um, uh, activity. So it could be possible that to be able to perform the ethylene, you must have this perfect carbon-carbon distance so that um, you can start to uptake uh, electron and protons to generate ethylene. So. I think this technology is quite promising for this. I, I'm looking forward to have more applications on that. Um, so synthesis of support materials are also possible, which has been conducted before as well. So just to give you an example from PAM water electrolysis, I like this article from a few years ago where they have shown uh, that um, uh, tungsten doped titanium dioxide decorated with iridium was quite stable for over a thousand hours. and. Um, then I, when I was looking at the previous publication with the VS particle is one of them about like almost a decade ago. 
that um, it is possible to decorate, for example, uh, gold on um, polystyrene nanospheres. So that was just like one application that was conducted. There are several others, which is uh, also possible in the literature. So there are techniques out there which could be employed to generate more different supported catalyst ma uh, materials to decrease the iridium content, for example. Um, Anti-corrosion coatings are also possible, which is not lately quite a hot topic for uh, pan water electrolysis because uh, titanium undergoes a, a oxidation and corrosion, which decreases the lifetime of the electrolyzer stack in general. Um, so what is usually conducted is titanium felt is coated with platinum, with thin platinum layer, so then um, you can preserve this uh, electrical uh, conductivity, lower the ele uh, low electrical resistance for over a long time. And uh, with this technique, we already employ this, so we also um, uh, immobilize platinum layers. And what we have seen is when we look from the top to the bottom, we have seen a deep pen uh, titanium penetration, which is quite different than line of sight uh, deposition systems such as uh, magnetron sputtering, um, which you usually don't really deposit to the back side of the fiber or three dimensionally. You cannot really coat the fiber. So in this case, um, just by making a top-down approach. You can always, of course, flip the sample and do it again to, from the other side. But uh, from analysis so far, this nanoparticle aerosol is a three-dimensional stream that is able to um, deposit on the whole um, entire uh, surface. Um, going a step beyond, um, in order to decrease the titanium amount even further for pan water electrolysis, um, this approach also brings the question, what if we just use stainless steel and coat it with a thick layer of titanium and then platinum to lower the um, capex of the system uh, so that uh, the titanium use in the system will be much less. There are articles that have been trying to do this, uh, but it hasn't been conducted before with uh, spark ablation, so this also begs the question if um, this could be also an interesting application. Coming to the last two, um, recombination catalyst coatings are quite also attractive because um, we would, like companies would like to conduct high pressure um, uh, water electrolysis, which is around 50, 70 uh, bars, and when there is a uh, differential pressure from the um, cathode to the anode, like if the anode is operating at the bomb bar, so it's highly possible that uh, hydrogen gas uh, could cross over through the NAF ion. And then if it is more than 4%, this is at the ignition limit with the oxygen, so which is posing a huge safety risk. So for that reason, um, a platinum back layer is applied so that this uh, hydrogen is immediately converted back to the proton, to the um, hydrogen ion. So this positively charged ion will travel back to the to the cathode to react to the to the to the hydrogen again. Um, so this uh, kind of like a back recombination catalyst coating could be also applied, um, just like uh, um, applying to the titanium felt, for example. Um, another application that I find which could be interesting is doping and functionalization. Um, I was checking this article where they doped iridium oxide with boron, for example. And they have shown that uh, it shows a higher stability versus undoped version. And they attribute it to creating some active sites, but also lowering the electrical uh, resistance. So I was thinking it would, could be possible by just uh, um, playing with their uh, ablation rate and then doping boron at a, at a rate that you would like to have. And the last thing is basically your imagination. So you can integrate almost any combination that you want. So you can play with many different parameters and you can uh, create a versatile, uh, use a versatile system to create an array of samples and then you can test them and screen them quite fast. So for example, um, I am thinking that for few cells even there are interesting applications that endoped carbons are quite attractive to lower the amount of um, pressure, uh, platinum grade materials that, that are used. Um, even there are some publications that are showing like N dope carbon activity without using platinum at all. But let's give, look at this example, a recent example in um, Nature Materials published in from the Peter Strasser group with the collaboration of BMW group that they have shown that nitrogen dope cap catchem black with decorated with platinum, it has more um, activity and higher porosity for uh, in, in fuel cell applications. So why not? Um, 
like using the two streams that I have um, shown you earlier to have N modified carbon, which is decorated with the platinum. So this could be an interesting application as well. And you can play with this and, um, flow rate of the gas or output rate or the amount of platinum quite um, quite easy, easier than most of the synthesis metals and you can make it much faster. So it's screening will be much, much quicker in my opinion. So this will complete, conclude my uh, presentation for the applications today. And uh, now is the Q&A session. So if you have any questions uh, regarding uh, what I have shown you today um, in those slides, please uh, please uh, raise, a, raise your hand, uh, please ask questions. So I will be happy to respond to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so let's look if there are any questions in the chat. Yes, I think we, I have, think a we have a question. Um, sure. There are hands also raised. Vincent, can you uh, can pick I, one? Can and ask? Can ask? We have a question from Sharma. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So thank you very Hi, much Sharma. for the nice webinar. It's very interesting. I have few questions. For example, yeah. uh, on the slide 16 and 17. Sure. I will get there. Yeah, if you see, there are cracks. So, let's is go it to cracks? Slide 15, 16, or 17, both. Uh, I, I okay. can go to anyone. Yeah. So, you can see yeah. like the figures, like first figure, there are cracks on the catalyst coated, I think, membrane. So, uh -huh. is it cracks? Yeah. Uh, so, is you it mean cracks are, yeah, it's a, it's a por porosity or it's a crack? Uh, so you mean uh, the image with the smooth version or with yeah, the rough one? Yeah, it's smooth one, it's smooth one. In a smooth one, um, I, I think, um, yeah, I think it, so um, this is a membrane. Uh, so the membrane was cut, right? Yeah. And it was yeah. taken then to the microscope and probably it was taped on a, uh, another substrate, so it was used with a tweezer. So probably okay. many things that were done on the okay. film okay. to get to that point. Um, probably there's, there's one parameter there. Uh, but on the other hand, also that that crack, let's say that line, is yeah. quite a factor of how much you zoom in. So if I would have shown you a magnification of 1000, there won't be any anything visible, I guess. So uh, probably if you say, okay, we have, we shouldn't have any cracks of two micron, right? Then there's okay. a recipe for it. So yeah. maybe that responds your question. Okay. And one more question, like I can see, okay, a microstructure looks very nice, but it's still we, we can say, see the agglomeration of the particles. Like, you uh, know. Uh, here you so, mean cross-section? Yeah, in anywhere. I mean, you know, ah. in all the cases, we can see the agglomeration of the iridium. So, yeah. if if one wants to avoid the agglomeration, like uh, you want, like uh, depending upon the loading, if you want to utilize all the loading for the activity, so we we need to avoid the agglomeration. So, is it possible to control, uh, you know, the dispersion of the loading or not in this method? Um, yes, it is. It is possible. So if you play with this um, parameter of uh, what will be your flow rate, what will be the uh, power that you ab uh, apply to generate nanoparticles, that will also change um, um, how much they will agglomerate on the fly. So okay. um, you you generate a nanoparticle. So let's see um, very quick. Yeah. So you generate a nanoparticles at the top, and let's say oh like the moment that it generates, it's the first few nuclei agglomerates and then they grow and they grow and they reach a certain size and then usually that's the size after like a few centimeters. But um, if you increase the flow so much or if you apply additional like heating or uh, additional cooling, so if you want to control this really, really precisely, there are some methods to, to implement. Okay. 
and last last one like uh, you know one of the parameter in the catalyst is like faceting of the nanoparticles mm, yeah you no know, different facet so that is mm. also possible in this me method uh so far i don't know um maybe there might be some publications who try to attempt this um okay. but honestly in in my let's say in my team or um in our group um in my postdoc time as well, we tried with yeah. faceting and every time when we have a nanoparticles like a function on the, on the material that are supplied to us by using organometallic synthesis, mm -hmm. after the first 20 minutes, all the facet was gone. Okay. So that has been also shown in institute TM analysis that uh, faceted gold becomes spherical gold after some time. So yeah, I, I, it's quite nice unless you if you want if you don't keep the um ligands then yeah. they are not really stable so um okay. faceting is quite niche application in my opinion yeah. industrial scalable uh, synthesis uh, requires a really high current density aggressive voltage yeah. aggressive acidic uh, alkaline conditions so yeah, yeah. i had thank some you. different yeah. things about it thanks yeah. okay okay thank you yeah. Yeah, next question. Yes, we have another question. Let me read it for you. Yeah. What is the typical rate of deposition and when moving to volume production of catalyst coated membranes? What rate do you think can be reached in the future? Uh, that's a good question. Um, at the moment, um, there is um, an output estimator. So, for example, um, I can I can try to show share this um, page with you because that's also a question that has been asked uh, quite a lot. Yeah, so this is the link that we can. Let's see. Um, we have the output estimator um, here. Um, yeah, so if you just write output estimator um, VS particle, the first link you can uh, go to that um, page, which is open to everyone, and then you can select the carrier gas that you have. Um, let's say we have carbon and then submit. And right now, um, by using argon, you have 23 milligram per hour, or if you use nitrogen, it goes up to 73. So this is just an, you know, a short, very short, high interest, uh, elements that were that were screened either by us or by the uh, publications on the of the literature. So then I could say, yeah, now the rate is between um, changes from due to the element or and the gas and the power that you use from one milligram to seventy milligram per hour. Um, this is from one nozzle, right? So when you would like to scale up the system. Um, the uh, concept that we propose um, and then we are working on is to have multiple nozzles um, lined up um, and then multiple lines following each other. So if you will have 10 nozzles, 10 times this number, and then you have, let's say, five lines, five times that, so 50 times of this, let's say, on, on a roll-to-roll -roll operation. So then we are talking about um, yeah several grams per hour with this version of the technology. So this is a G1 P1 combo. Um, on top of that, right now uh, the second generation is also um, being implemented, and the second generation is for a much different level. Uh, right now the second generation can provide up to like 50 times more um, output. So you can also multiply this with 50 again. So, um, so then briefly, it is um, right now the limit is up to 70 milligram per hour for from what from one nozzle. So then, then the question is how, question is how many nozzles do you want to you want to use? I hope that responds to your question. That was not mine, but I think that that answered the yeah, question I mean, from the It's uh, not. We, it's we had the last I, one, but I think you yeah. partly answered it. But maybe it's good also to summarize uh, yeah. what other applications uh, can the nanoprinter be used for. 
I think you you mentioned that, of course, but if you can maybe just quickly summarize to 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 wrap up this uh, this webinar. Yeah, uh, of course. Um, so like I uh, like I showed in the in the presentation, um, you can. Uh, where is that? So you can conduct it on. Um, where is this? Uh, you can conduct it for uh, PAM water electrolysis, uh, alkaline water electrolysis. So I, I would say almost any application that uses um, 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 semiconductors and conductors, you can you can employ it. Like you can employ it for batteries, for example, for conversion type of batteries, like uh, use that use silicon, carbon, or antimony or tin, right? Uh, because it has a high porosity, high surface area with nanoparticles, the intercal uh, conversion of the lithium will be quite efficient, in my opinion. And the expansion could be quite limited um, with the high porosity. Um, magnetic samples, I guess, like magnesium boride, I guess, it has a high, uh, uh, um, it shows some superconductivity as well. So you can try like some niche applications like that um yeah solid state systems like sensors have been applied at the moment in our uh, in our facility that we have been collaborating with very big sensor producers that um that you can uh, yeah have sensors for any gas uh, sensing um and yeah the catalysis applications conventional heterogeneous catalysis we have shown some work before and yeah, electrocatalysis, it's the big window, right? So it's uh, water electrolysis, alkaline CO2 electrolysis, upcoming nitrogen fixation. So um, yeah, I think these are the first ones that come to my head. All right, thank you. I don't, thank you very much, first of all. And I don't see for now uh, other questions. Are there maybe a last one or two last questions? Yeah, if there are any burning questions, feel, uh, please feel free so to ask now. If not, I wanted to mention a few things before uh, ending this webinar. Like you can see in the chat, uh, I sent to all of you um, two email addresses. If you have questions that come to your mind afterwards, uh, info at vsparticle.com. You can also directly contact me, uh, v.mazzola at vsparticle.com. Uh, I also thought maybe if uh, some of you want the recorded version of this webinar, uh, that is possible, but you have to make a request via email and then we can send you uh, the, the video. And uh, I think I think that's all from my side. I don't know, Ardem, if you want to conclude uh, on anything or if. Uh, uh, no, thank you very much. So if you have, like Winston said, have any further questions, please feel free to write an email to info at vsparticle.com or um, you can reach out to Vincent or to me uh, from our <clears throat> emails as well Vincent will provide it so exactly also regarding pricing and maybe a last thing that I can mention if you are uh, people working or studying in the Netherlands in Belgium or in Germany so close by our office which is in Delft feel free also to request an on-site demo of our printer where you can potentially visit our lab we can organize that in the coming weeks or months and you can see a live demonstration uh, interactive demonstration of the of the features and possibilities of the of the printer. OK, All right, so I think we're done with this webinar. Thank you very much to everyone in the audience. Thank you, Erdem. Thank uh, you. And like I say, feel free to contact us anytime if you have further question. And I wish you a really nice sunny day. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye, bye everyone.